Hi everyone, it's Becky here. Welcome to another new video on my YouTube channel. Today I am taking the SkyTrain to Burrard Station. This is actually a video I filmed a very long time ago in the beginning of spring. And um, here is the metro town area that I used to live when I was in high school. Always love looking at the sky and the mountains in the distance and the streetscapes of Vancouver when I'm on the sky train. Yeah, so I filmed this video on April the 5th, 2023. And the weather pattern in Vancouver was still transiting from the overcast winter days to bright sunny spring days. So here I am outside Burrard Skytrain Station. The cherry blossoms are in abundance. I'm sitting down on a bench and holding up my new sketchbook. So here is the Speedball brand handbook art journal, 140 pounds watercolor paper. And I'm ready to sketch a view right in front of me. A lot of people are taking photos with the cherry blossoms. Because I'm right-handed, I like to start drawing from the left first. I'm beginning with a main cherry tree that I see on the left, which is pretty prominent. Starting with the trunk area and connecting these major branches with the trunk. Apparently, these are actually two trees hugging each other very closely and um, a lamp behind. So when I'm sketching, I'm always looking at the relationships of um, overlapping objects. So I always like to draw the object that's in the uh, front first and then the ones behind it. Now I'm starting to add these little twigs emerging from the major branches. These are kind of like little claws. And now I am moving down to the bottom of the lamppost and these two trees to add some bushy outlines. So there are lots of clusters of bushes and shrubs in this courtyard. And so the drawing speed you're watching right now is in real time. I had to cut some parts off just to make sure that this video is not way too tedious to watch. And I'm just using very loose lines to depict the texture of bushes here and dark ink areas for the gaps in between the leaves. Now I'm starting to draw a lady walking down the staircase, starting with a head and a bit of hair, her upper body, her arm holding onto her handbag. So when drawing people in motion, I have to use my memory or uh, combining several people's um, upper body and lower bodies together to form one figure in my drawing. Now I'm starting to draw the railing behind her legs. It's going upwards towards the right. The thickness of the railing. And um, I want to shade her pants with solid black so it separates better with the railings behind. And there's actually another row of railings behind. This is very close overlapping. Okay, and some more vertical bars. Now I'm drawing another person walking upwards. He was wearing a winter hat, jacket, and the leg is actually bending in a really active walking gesture. There's a leg in the front and the other one behind. And I also shaded in his jacket with solid black ink to separate with the uh, details in his back. And I just drew the staircase behind the guy and starting to add some more bushy textures using very loose and squiggly lines. So these are the uh, rhododendron leaves and then add more stairs behind. And just keeping the stairs really simple with a bunch of parallel lines and coming back to the rhododendron bush over here to add some more patterns of these clusters of leaves. So for rhododendron shrubs, um, it's made of uh, small clusters of uh, a group of leaves of five or six. And some more quick squiggly lines for another species of shrub over here. 
and shading in some of the uh, large gaps with uh, solid black ink to give this shrub more volume rather than just lines for the leaves. Yeah, so using hatching lines and repeating hatching lines to give a really dense area of shadow in organic patches. And a little bit down. So I'm not drawing all of those leafy details all the way until the bottom of the page. I want to leave like a white area on the bottom for a title and my note. Now drawing another guy in hat. Again, starting with the head, the upper body. I think he was holding a toolbox. So these people walking in and out of the metro station, they are working in different fields of careers. So it's really great. It's a really nice narrative to have these people of different identities and um, adding some more leafy textures. So as I mentioned before, this is real time drawing speed. I like to get these details done really quickly because um, it's pretty much impossible and it's very dizzy to stare at those details in front of you and try to copy. So I'm actually summarizing. Um, I'm not actually including every single leaf that's out there. I'm trying to capture the form, the, the direction of these leaves are laying. They're kind of draping downwards. And so now I'm using a very much a blind contour drawing technique, very barely looking at the paper and just kind of contemplating at the bushy details in front of me and get these details done really quickly. And then now I'm drawing another section of staircase railings behind this uh, toolbox man and adding this little tree laying out the major branches connecting with a little trunk and um, a small number of leaves hanging on the branches. So there are actually so many cute little things to see in a really mundane situation. I really like this little tree. Okay, and now I am connecting more bushy details underneath it. Yeah, using the very much the same summarizing technique and then fill in some of the gaps with solid black ink for volume. As you can see, I am not drawing all of these leafy details all the way until the corner or the bottom of the page because I want this to be like a really relaxing uh, way of framing this urban landscape. When you're drawing you know, a landscape in front of you, you don't have to include every single part that's in front of you. This is a very small selection of what's in front of me. Now I'm drawing this lady walking upstairs and then coloring in her hair with solid black ink. And also coloring in her pants with black ink. Play with the balance of uh, black and white areas and um, a bit more leafy details on the side. Now I'm ready to draw this cherry tree behind the bushes. Again, focusing on the major branches and the, uh, the connections between the branches and the trunk. So I love tracing out these organic curves of trees. So these trees, even though they're not moving uh, as we see as humans, I feel like they're actually dancing with the rhythm of the universe. When I'm drawing trees, I could somehow feel the sap flowing inside the trunks and branches and uh, imagine how the cherry blossoms are being produced by these trees. Nature is just so magical. And I think a lot of times we are taking these beautiful sights for granted without thinking too much. Okay, so now I'm adding these more organic curves of trees behind. They're looking a little shorter and smaller because they're in the distance. So there are at least two layers of cherry trees. 
and this location, this little courtyard outside the Burrard Skytrain station, is one of the、uh, famous cherry blossom spots. So every spring, there are a lot of people、um, touring around here, taking pictures of the cherry blossoms. And sharing on social media. So for me, I want to use a different way to document、uh, these cherry blossoms by sketching, filming, and share with you all from all over the world. And add a couple more smaller trees there in the distance, keeping my lines really loose. So some of these branches and twigs they don't have to look connected、uh, with the ones beside. So having loose gaps or broken lines. You know, things not completely connected with one another is one of the ways for us to sketching very loosely to leave some space for things to breathe.、Uh, because everything in the world they're moving. When the when the wind is blowing, the branches are actually swaying in the wind, and so they don't have a very stable placement in the landscape. Now I am drawing the top of the wall here, behind the lamp post and the two hugging trees on the left. Uh, the brim area. There's actually、um, a row of shrubs right on top of the wall here, on the street level. Yeah, and just using very small little squiggly lines for the shrub textures. All right, so now I'm ready to add the、uh, the large brick pattern for the wall here. It's really fun to skip around the objects in front of it. Yeah, so those horizontal lines and short little vertical lines, a bit of accentuation, to show a sense of relief of that slab. And some more on the very left side. Now I am drawing some more trees on the street level behind the row of shrubs. So as I mentioned before, I'm using very loose and broken organic lines, especially for these trees in the distance. So you can completely relax your hand. So these outlines they don't have to look so solid compared to the trees, the hugging trees on the very left in the foreground. For objects and details in the back, I like to keep them more vague and not coming forward to compete with the foreground details. And so this is a very interesting and also an unusual、um, urban landscape. So it contains several levels of above ground and underground,、um, horizontally foreground and background areas. And I'm using very gentle hand pressure to create these feathery lines of twigs in between the clusters of cherry blossoms. So I am not drawing the cherry blossoms with、uh, ink pen. I'm just gonna just do the the pink clouds very loosely with、uh, two to three layers of pinks. Now I am just drawing the twigs in between. So these cherry blossoms are of the、uh, the very light and milky pink kind, and they don't have very、um, solid outlines for the flowers. From far away, I see them as、uh, masses of pink clouds, without any harsh definitions for the uh, for the uh, blossoms. Yeah, so I just leave the blossoms for the watercolor paint. Adding some more trees. There are actually so many. I'm trying to see and include. As many as I can, and、um, this one is actually a van parked on the side of the street, and adding some、um, other small foliage details in between these trees. Drawing a car right by the entrance of this、uh, SkyTrain station staircase. And then drawing this man to give even more sense of depth that he is much smaller compared to the ones walking up and down the staircases. And now I'm coming back to this bushy area of the foreground to add more textures. 
and there are, I think, a couple more benches on the higher ground beside me. Yeah, so just adding the bars of the bench there. Some more foliage textures. So when we're doing an urban landscape sketch with a lot of foliage elements, such as this one, I think it's very important to consider which parts that we should be outlining with pen and what, a, what other areas that we should just leave out for the uh, watercolors. So in this case, I'm just drawing the solid shapes of the tree trunks and some of the branches showing very clearly to me and the foliage shapes in the foreground. I am not drawing the uh, cherry blossom clusters in the uh, tree canopy area because otherwise those gentle colored blossoms will look too harsh. I'm just going to keep the canopy of the cherry trees very simple with uh, two to three layers of pink washes. Now I'm using pretty gentle and skipping in between these tree trunks and branches to draw the, uh, the awning of the uh, shopping center on the other side of the street. Yeah, so these um, slanting bars of the awning. So I'm doing this to add another layer of sense of depth. Yeah, and these are actually pretty easy line just to keep your hand pressure really gentle to get these done. And the brackets of the doors and the window frames. And just to add a few more little twigs sticking out of the uh, cherry blossom canopy. And that's very much it for the line drawing part. Final few tweaks over here. Now it's time to paint watercolors. So I'm just wetting the uh, cherry tree canopy areas with a little clear water and a very diluted lemon yellow to give a sense of sun shining through the trees. Now I am laying on and using very fat brush strokes to get the, um, the first layer of the cherry blossom colors done. This is a diluted version of red. And I am using a really relaxing gesture to punch these brush strokes on. This is wet onto moist. As you can see, there's still a bit of a sense of brush strokes showing, but they don't look too harsh because the color is very gentle and also the previous layer is still moist. So sometimes if you're seeing your painting is having a lot of harsh brush strokes, that could be uh, of two reasons. One is that your color is uh, way too concentrated. You need to dilute it a little bit more or the previous layer is uh, all dried up. You need to have a moist layer before you lay on another layer for these soft effects of brush strokes. And at the same time, I'm also merging a lot of these brush strokes together so they don't stand out individually with a lot of white gaps in between. And yeah, so this species of cherry trees have very gentle colored uh, blossoms. So that's the first layer. Second layer, wet onto moist. It's a more concentrated uh, magenta color. Or you can use any pinkish color in your watercolor palette. And now my brush stroke is getting smaller as I'm using just the tip of the brush by holding it about 70 degrees to the paper. So overall, the more vertically that you're holding your brush, the smaller your brush strokes are going to be. And so yeah, just playing with this uh, wet onto moist. So I think this is a very good time that I'm laying the second layer of more concentrated pink. Uh, the, uh, the previous layer is not too dried up or too wet either. So if the previous layer is all dried up, I would end up with a lot of harsh brush strokes. If the previous layer is way too wet, this concentrated pink is going to be diluted by the previous layer's water and it's gonna merge down with the uh, previous layer and not showing a clear second layer at all. So overall, when you're painting with watercolors, especially when you're doing wet onto wet technique, it's very important to know how wet, how moist, 
that your water or the previous layer should be before you add a new layer. Now I just wetted this uh, soil area with a little clear water and I just uh, punched on a bit of orange mixed with burnt sienna. And a little bit more orange mixed with a little bit of yellow ochre as well. So the soil, it just looks brown from the first sight. If you look more deeply, you're gonna see other tones such as yellow ochre, orange, light brown, and the darker brown such as sepia. And I'm just wetting that wall with a little bit of uh, leftover yellow orange for the um, illumination from the sunshine. And this part is, a, is an elevated area, like a little hill with more foliage on it. Yeah, so just wet that soil area with uh, yellow brown, yellow orange. And just lightly wet these leafy areas with a little bit of um, yellowish color, like yellow ochre, kind of like an underpainting before putting on the greens of the leaves. This really establish a sense of unity for this large chunky area of soil and leaves. Now I'm punching on the first layer of these uh, clusters of leaves. It's a mix of lime green with a bit of uh, yellow ochre and cadmium yellow. Again, for the first layer of everything, I like to keep it really gentle. Overall, trees and bushes are green, but there always contains so many layers or intensities of green. So you have to start from the lightest layer when you're painting watercolors. Okay, and now I am mixing like a mid-tone of green with verdin green and a bit of uh, yellow ochre or cadmium yellow, depending on your taste. There's no um, absolute recipe of how to mix uh, a bushy or a tree color. It really depends on your own taste. The color could be more or less vibrant. For me, I like to use more vibrant colors than they seem in real life. Yeah, so this one is pretty much Viridian Green. As it's merging with the first layer of yellow green, the town is not the 100% uh, Viridian Green anymore. It's interacting with the previous layer of yellow, yellow orange, yellow brown underneath, giving it a more organic look. And mixing some more mid greens with Viridian Green and a bit of cadmium yellow or yellow ochre. And putting little dashes of brush marks for the higher land area. And a little bit in between the lower area. Okay, so now I just grab a little bit of uh, uh, magenta, pretty concentrated to paint the rhododendron buds and a bit of burnt sienna diluted with a lot of water so it looks pretty translucent. This is the, uh, the wet on dry technique. The first layer of the soil is all dry so now I'm actually kind of glazing on this uh, burnt sienna or mid brown color for the soil. So the first layer is still sort of shining through and not being completely covered by this brown. So again, I love playing with layering and not just uh, painting a very solid color for a single area. Yeah, and keep kind of uh, using a small circular motion to get the texture of the soil on here. And a little bit of gentle traces of brush marks are fine. We don't have to flatten all of our brush marks. Brush marks are really important to give texture, especially for an uneven surface. Yeah, and some more burnt sienna in quick gentle dashes here and there and in between the bushes. There are a lot of areas where the outlines of these foliage shapes are very vague and just merging with the soil. So that's why I'm punching these, uh, this burnt sienna or brown color in between. And the rule of uh, adding these two colors is that um, there's no clear boundary in between these two. Um, even though it's, I have outlined uh, the foliage shapes, they, I could paint over the outline with the green and also having a bit of brown pushing into the foliage shapes. 
And that's how we give our watercolor paintings a more natural and organic look is that you don't have to constrict yourself with outlines. You could always paint outside the outlines or having other colors pushed into the outlines of other things. So just relax. Okay, so the sunshine is going in and out, but now it's sunny again. So I am punching on a little bit of diluted cadmium yellow to show the uh, luminosity going through the pink cherry blossoms, which is very important. Everything in the world is actually, uh, they don't stand alone as one single object. It's often being affected, especially by the color of the sunshine, that the original colors of those things don't stay in a stable color. And now I'm adding the first layer of these tree trunks and branches with um, a little bit of leftover green mixed with the burnt sienna. So this is the uh, pretty much the lightest tone of the cherry tree bark. And now wet onto wet, I just mix a little bit of blue into burnt sienna for a darker shade. Putting most of the shade color on the left side because the sunshine comes from the right. Painting in a very flexible and gentle way, just skip around uh, these curves. Some areas are brighter, probably because they're kind of curving forward, catching some more sunshine. Yeah, so basically I'm playing with water control. This is very much the, like the same brown. If your hand is pressing a little harder on the brush, you're going to have a slightly stronger brown. And for some other areas, if you just glide very quickly through, it's going to have a pretty light diluted version of that same color. So I'm actually doing these movements according to my real time observations. If you're watching this video on a big screen, you're going to see that these three branches are not of the single tone of the same brown. I played a lot with water control. Now I'm ready to add on a third layer for the cherry blossom canopies. This is very much wet on dry because I don't want too much blooming to happen. These are very much very solid and crisp, but not way too harsh looking brush strokes on top. I'm using a very juicy large tip water brush so it's merging many of the brush strokes together. And so they look strong, soft, at the same time, not way too harsh. Yeah, and some more in between the gaps of the branches here for higher definition. So some years ago, when I first began tackling cherry blossoms, I used to draw all of the clusters with ink pen that I found out, you know, looking back at my old sketchbooks, those cherry trees look way too harsh. So I just decided to just keep it simple by just drawing the tree trunks and branches with ink pens only and some gentle pen strokes of twigs and just leave the puffy canopy areas for the brush pen and two to three layers of pinks. So in this way, it's very relaxing for both myself and the other people to look at it as well. And the weather today is actually very unstable. And so the contrast of light and shade is pretty low. And also this area is actually because it's lower in elevation, uh, the lighting condition is pretty tricky to capture. And by squinting my eyes a bit, so when we're squinting our eyes, we could see uh, the definitions of colors or other kind of details better. So I see the bottom of each canopy area has slight bit of purple. So I just grabbed a bit of royal purple and just putting on these little punches of blossom definitions on the uh, bottom area of each tree where the flowers are the most dense, giving cast shadows on each other. At the same time, the bottom of each tree's canopy area is catching the least amount of sunshine compared to the middle and the top area. Yeah, so some more royal purple. I don't want the royal purple to look way too harsh. So that means I'm diluting this purple quite a bit with water. 
putting it very gently around the middle to the bottom area of these trees. Yeah, some brush strokes are almost invisible, but the definition is there. It's just better than, you know, adding nothing at all. And a bit of uh, impressionistic strokes of sunshine using leftover yellow. It's a really mellow yellow on top of those two trees closer to the sun on the right. Yeah, so basically keeping this yellow super diluted is there, but not way too strong, seeping through the top parts of these trees on the right. Yeah, a little bit more here. Sometimes it's going all the way to the lower part of the tree. A nice warm yellow floating on top. Okay, so now I'm ready to paint these shrubs on the high wall, on the uh, ground level, actually, using leftover Viridian Green. And some brown mixed into the green for that, um, you know, that, that area of foliage merging with the earth somehow. And using leftover blue mixed with purple, so I come up with like a neutral gray to paint the concrete wall here. Yeah, so it's good to have like a neutral color to balance out uh, the warm and cold colors. And also for these staircase, leftover blue mixed with uh, leftover pink purple with a lot of water. And adding some retouches of greens using leftover varying green for some bits that I forgot to fill. And a bit of contrast for the uh, bushes up there on the wall. It's that very thin green mixed in with a little bit of burnt sienna, just for the bottom, the middle to the bottom part of the bushes. So now I am adding the final layer for contrast using like the darkest shade of green. So we could make a green even denser by mixing burnt sienna into it. Okay, so this is Viridian Green mixed with uh, burnt Sienna, and my brush stroke is very, very small. Um, this shade color is actually very minimal. I want to preserve most of the light and medium tones, which are the most fresh greens. Shade colors are essential, but they're not all over. Okay, so after that, I'm ready to add more contrast for the tree branches. So we could mix an even more intense brown or sepia color by mixing blue into burnt sienna. And also this layer it contains more paint and way less water compared to the previous layers. Again, being very, very flexible following my observation and sensations, I'm not spreading this dark sepia all over these branches. I had to leave some areas to shine of the previous layer because these shapes are actually organic cylinders. They are not just flat slabs. Some areas are curving around, going forward closer to the sun. So that's why some areas are looking brighter, very subtly. Holding my brush 90 degrees to the paper to create these very thin brush strokes for the uh, twigs in between the clusters holding the clusters of blossoms together. So as I mentioned before, we don't have to do all of the detailed renderings with our ink pens. We could use, just use the tip of our brushes to get some of those done so they look more organic. Yeah, for example, these twigs. And some higher definition for this tree here in the foreground. As you can see, a lot of broken segments of brush strokes to suggest that the way that the sunshine is landing on an, in a very uneven way on these trees. Yeah, so this is the beauty of nature. It's never perfect. Things in the world, they don't have a uniform color or tone. And now I am mixing a turquoise color diluted with a lot of water 
to paint these glassy panels of the awning for the exterior of the shopping center. Yeah, so glass, it has this kind of transparent quality. So I'm keeping my blue, purple, or turquoise of that glass color really transparent. At the same time, I want this tone to be gentle and not coming forward to compete with the uh, important details in the foreground. Yeah, just a slight bit more contrast with a diluted version of gray. Just using simple brush strokes to get each panel done without um, stirring too much. So overall, sketching this urban landscape is pretty challenging. There are a lot of things to analyze, to simplify, to think about what to include and what not to include. This is a very special experience, more than just copying what's in front of me or copying from a photo. So drawing and painting from real life observations is actually much more challenging than working with a really ideal landscape. For example, a barn with trees around it, perfect blue sky above, or a little house surrounded with beautiful flowers and trees. So those kind of landscapes are pretty easy to analyze and get things done. But for me, I always like to challenge myself to try something new rather than repeating what other artists had already done. And now I am using the leftover bluish grays to paint these lampposts here and there. Yeah, there's one small one there in the distance on the ground level. And a few more brush strokes to get a little bit of contrast of the metallic surfaces, the railings of the staircases. Again, these leftover colors on my palette are very handy so I don't have to grab and mix again from scratch. It saves a lot of time. So I never clean my mixing area and also using little punches to uh, paint each concrete brick of the wall area. Okay, and again, grabbing some pretty vibrant dark colors to paint these people's outfits. I don't remember exactly what these people were wearing, but I know most people these days, they like to wear blue jeans, dark colored jackets. So a lot of blues and purples. Okay, so now I am moving to the final polish stage of my painting. I find that these, um, these tree branches need even more contrast. So when watercolor paint dries, the intensity tend to fade away and the contrast is not that high anymore. So now I am going back to mix a dark sepia color with burnt sienna, mix in with a bit of blue. This time, um, trying to mix in less water, more concentrated pigment. Yeah, a few broken segments over here. These branches are actually the most dramatic areas. The canopies are like in general the canopies are pretty flat but these tree trunks and branches they have more contrast compared to the flowers and using this leftover sepia color trying to mix less water into it for some stronger chunks of soil there are actually some wooden chips mix in and so the texture is stronger than just soil and a lot of patience when we're painting. So yeah, really take your time to slow down and calm down. Every single brush stroke should be different from one another to depict the natural feel of the things you're painting. And finally, I've reached the end of my painting. Thank you so much for taking your time and patience to watch this very long video. Here's the look of my finished sketch and I just wrote down a title, Burrard Station and the time and a little note. Thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. If you like it, please click like and leave me a comment below. Subscribe to my channel for weekly updates. So now I just came back from a two week break of editing videos. I will upload videos more regularly 
two to three videos every week. And I will see you very soon next time. Have a great day, everyone.